every kid says to me, I have to have a dig pit. So <laughs> I'll be having some sort of a sandbox somewhere where they can get in and dig out their own bones and sort of that lends itself to the ability to have special guests come in mm. and, you know, if we bury something in particular into that dig pit, we can perhaps have an expert in that particular animal come in. That was Deb Cook, who along with Jamie are putting together the Gympie Bone Museum project in Gympie in regional Queensland. Got to love people supporting their community. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Yes, welcome again to another Physics Ed Podcast. This episode is quite interesting because Deb and Jamie are not only doing the Gimpy Bone Museum project, they also run two businesses, not one, two, Dissection Connection and Rock Hounds, which is incredibly interesting considering that Deb also still helps out as a lab technician for Gimpy State High School and both of them are heavily involved with a local STEM hub too. Talk about really, really busy. Let's dive into this interview. We've got a lot to learn here. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Deborah Cook, welcome to the Physics Ed Podcast. Thank you very much. It's very exciting. Uh, it is. I've actually been wanting to get you on involved for quite a while now because I know that you've been heavily involved in science for many, many years. And I was trying to work out, to be honest, um, how would I even start this interview? Because you, you just don't do just one thing. You do a lot of things. Uh, so let's just do, let's cover that for a start. Um, Deb, what do you do? What do we do? Look, primarily we sell body parts. <laughs> That's a good way to start. <laughs> <laughs> what we say at parties. Okay, gotcha. So you're referring to Dissection Connection. That's right. So we run Dissection Connection and we have done for seven years with um, my partner, Jamie. And we supply dissection specimens to schools and unis and now quite a lot of medical training as well, surgeons um, training and skill like up-to-dateness. Yep. Um, so yeah, we do the software there. Other people do the hardware. Uh, and then four years ago, we thought, oh, we like rocks and we didn't like the rocks that other people were supplying to schools. So now we do rock hounds rocks as well, which is, um, geology specimens that rock really big, nice hand sized specimens where teachers can really, um, see the the parts of the rock, you know, and, and the features of the, the specimen so that they can really teach, not those little thumbnail-sized things that kids are trying to work out how the hell that came out of a volcano. Yep. Because <laughs> um, volcanoes are big and that rock's tiny and that's really boring. <laughs> Fair enough. And then a year ago or two years ago, I said to Jamie, I've had an idea. And Jamie's lovely and he always says, yep. That sounds great. So now we're a year into the Gimpy Bone Museum, which is a not-for-profit project that we've got going in our town uh, because our town is imminently going to be bypassed by the highway. So we would like to have something really unique here in Gimpy to encourage people to continue to visit Gimpy after that highway has gone past. So, yeah, no sleep for Deb and Jamie. But especially, especially when... Uh in amongst this, you also help out at Gympie State High School. Oh, that's right. When they get sick or injured, they ring me up and I, I say, yes, I'll do that. And that's kind of nice because I get to go back into the classroom and it, you know, keeps you a bit up to date with where teachers are at and just reminds you that um, teachers and labbies work really hard. Actually, speaking of which, like when we contacted you a couple of weeks ago, said, hey, I would love you to come on this podcast. You were scrambling to put on an event for a Science Week as well. That's right. There's recently the Gympie Regional STEM Hub has started up in Gympie, um, Inspiring Australia are behind that, and we joined up with them. So that's quite a, a large group of schools and um, other STEM people in town. And, uh, yeah, we thought, oh, you know, we haven't done any physics for a while, so Jamie built a hologram projector and took it up to the school, and there you go, STEM Hub as well. It's all happening, Ben. It is. And that's what I was like, I was trying to think in my head, where are we going to, what are we going to talk about first? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where do we go? So, um, all right. So let, let, let's go to the start. So firstly, uh, what got you involved in being no, no, right to the very start, getting involved as a lab tech in the first place before we even get into all the other stuff that you do? 
I did industrial chemistry at uni. Ah, right. And in the very last semester of that degree, um, it was a very heavily uh, practical degree. We had uh, 30 hours in the lab every week and I really loved lab work. Um, But in the very last semester, they took us on a site tour and we went to a number of different industrial sites to give us an idea of like what we would be doing when we graduated. Yep. And I looked at all those jobs and went, I really don't want to do that. (laughs) Right. And I'm three and a half years into a degree only because they all looked pretty repetitive to me. So not that I didn't like the science and probably if I'd gone into there and gotten more tied up in the kind of research and development areas of um, industrial chemistry, then maybe I would have been interested. But the day-to-day, how salty are the chips coming off the production line kind of chemistry just didn't turn me on at all. So I ran away to Japan for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? And I saw uh, an ad in the local paper for a lab technician at a local high school. And my high school had lab technicians um, that were really involved in extracurricular stuff. So I did that crystal growing competition and we made paper and all that sort of thing. And it was the lab techs that ran those activities at lunchtime and after school. Yep. So I knew what that person did and I thought, oh, I might have a crack at that because that's quite varied. And I did get my first job in a school and I was lucky enough to work with someone who was really experienced and had been doing it for a long time and I really loved it. I loved it. You get to do all sorts of different science and you get to, you know, pull things out of your back pocket at the last minute. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You have to do a lot with not much money and it um, it was engaging and interesting and I really, really enjoyed it. So well, it, must, it must be clear because, like, you, you've got a lot on your plate and you're still doing a bit of work here and there to help out the local high school. I mean, you could have easily just fallen into this and, mind you, not, I mean, not for the words just, like you were, like, the technicians were the backbone of any science department in any high school and the fact that you're doing all those extracurricular activities as well, I mean, I can imagine you can easily be in your element alone, let alone doing all the other stuff you do as well. What made you go, go you know what, I'm going to go do other stuff on top of this? I think we, Jamie and I were just sick of the public service. I went and worked in tissue culture research for a little while just as a, um, a secondment, and that was a nice change from schools, and I, I got some new skills there, but that's where I met Jamie, and we just found ourselves sort of talking about different um, businesses that we might do together. Yep. And I did go back to school after that secondment finished, uh, but the, I had the bug there to be doing something for myself and after a while the public service will grind you down to a tiny little knob. <laughs> That's a very <laughs> geological process of you. Yes, indeed. Yes. <laughs> um, and honestly, I thought that Dissection Connection might get me out of school for a day or two every week and I fully expected to be part-time school, part-time business. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just took off and it grew really quickly and now we're both full-time in the business and we've got a young man that works for us um, most of the week as well and here we are spreading our wings further and further every year. Absolutely. Okay, let's let, let's go into what Dissection Connection does. Like, to be honest, like we love you guys. We uh, just, you know, full disclosure for everyone listening, yes, we use Dissection Connection ourselves at Physics because – of a number of reasons which we all want to go into. What does Dissection Connection actually do for high schools and education departments across the country? Chop up animals, right? <laughs> they produce the materials and, and all the bits that you can do. I mean, like why wouldn't um, a high schooler just go, okay, I'm just going to go down to the local butcher? Yeah, which is what we all used to do. Um, and when I worked in the city, that's what I used to do. I had to use the local butcher around the corner. And butchers in the city... Mm -hmm. are rarely in touch directly with their abattoirs anymore. They tend to go through meat wholesalers. So the meat goes from the abattoir to the wholesaler and the wholesaler is the one that actually takes the orders and delivers to the butcher. So you've now got an extra layer of complexity between yourself as the school customer and the abattoir when you need a a heart that hasn't been slashed open and still has its top on so the great vessels are there and an eye that hasn't had the uh, 
the abattoir worker's thumb pushed through it, you know. Yep. <laughs> and um, it's not something that abattoirs do every day. So they're generally reasonably happy to do it for schools, but it's one of those things that they'll out of the blue get an order for two hearts, seven eyes, a brain and a bit of spinal cord and it's completely out of their normal range of production. So they get forgotten or um, it gets collected but it gets left in the cold room and doesn't make it to the city to the butcher. So you'll, as a customer, rock up to the butcher and either receive nothing because they've forgotten to collect it or forgotten to deliver it or what they've delivered is slashed or ruined or unsuitable for the teachers so you go back to school and you actually haven't got anything and that's exactly why we work with you guys because um, not only do you source this stuff ethically i mean that's critically important Mm -hmm. but you get why they're going to a classroom in the first place (laughs) like totally um i mean that's the thing you can actually see the aorta you can see all the different valves and everything's all intact otherwise you're just giving a here kids have some pulp (laughs) yeah that's right and i would like to say that uh, we've got the abattoirs sorted out and we've had the lash out and um, they deliver perfect product all the time, but they still don't. It still happens that we have to, like, visually inspect every single specimen that comes through the shed here. Mm. So um, we still have a lot of wastage, but at least once it gets to you guys or to the school or to the surgeons, they know that what they pull out of the packet is going to be useful. That's interesting. So you're helping surgeons train or become trained. I mean, who are you working with with that? Like- um, Royal North Shore Hospital. Right. The Australian College of Cardio and Thoracic Surgeons. Um, lots and lots of different places. And occasionally um, emergency airway management is something that we provide trachea specimens for. Wow. And they're done in most hospital regions at least once a year. It's one of those things that they don't actually have to perform that procedure very much. You know MacGyver and the pen? Yes, yes. Uh, They don't have to do it very often, but when they do have to do it, you're really in trouble. Oh, yeah. And so they have to know what they're doing and they need to practice it. Even a very experienced doctor will practice it. And they used to practice on electrical, like plastic electrical conduit tube. Oh, that's no good compared to what you're doing. It's not the same. It's just not the same. So, um, yeah, I like to think that if I'm ever in that much trouble, somebody's actually had their hands on a piece of meat. <laughs> yep. And the thing is, like, you're not just supplying stuff like just, you know, taking an order and then sending it off and, you know, clipping the ticket effectively. Like you genuinely are involved in teaching. You do a lot of professional development with teachers, which is fantastic. We do. And, you know, we, we do a lot of teach the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because actually it's the quickest way to get to a really large group of kids is to get a group of teachers in a room, throw yeah. a specimen in front of them that they've either never seen or the, the ones I really like is when I throw something like a pluck in front of them and they've all been doing it for quite a long time, these teachers, but I'm always able to give them something new. I like to go into that room with three things that you probably didn't know about that specimen when you came to it um and i just see a bit of um enthusiasm and interest come back into those teachers yeah right Um, you know teaching life is a lot of meetings and a lot of hard grind and um when you actually give them something that enthuses them a little bit more it gets straight back to the classroom so if i had 30 teachers in a classroom, you can imagine how many kids benefit from that in the long run. Oh, totally. Now, there'll be some people who um, are totally aware exactly what pluck is, but then there might be some people who've got no idea what pluck is. So just describe what that would what it looks like. Oh, pluck's really great. It's like five kilos of everything from your tongue down to your liver, so <laughs> your throat and your, uh, your lungs and your heart, the diaphragm, the liver, and um, you can blow up the lungs and you can do a heart dissection and you can check out the, the trachea and the tongue and the taste buds and all of that sort of thing. So it's actually um, a gateway to all the body systems, a plug. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's not just about just um, traditional dissecting a rat or a chicken wing and that's it. I mean, there's lots of different things you can look at. Right. Which is very, very cool. Um, so how do you balance this with rock hounds? Because rock hounds is a completely different kettle of fish or rock, so to speak. 
It is. So it's got its own corner of the shed and some pretty heavy-duty shelving to hold them all up. Gee, not so heavy. One day I'm going to come up with a business where we sell something that's very small and very light and doesn't require special freight consideration. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, one, of the, one of the people at work, Holly, was saying she'd come across a blog about um, Obama who, who's joke with his friend, uh, I, I hope this is correct, I have to go check this out, and uh, sorry if I got this wrong, but the, his, his joke with his friend is he wished he'd set up a, a, a shop just called uh, Medium White T-Shirt. And what Medium White T-Shirt does is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. you, you get a Medium White T-Shirt, not large, not small, and not any other colour. It's Medium White. <laughs> and um, I, think, I think maybe he, uh, he wishes for simplicity. <laughs> yeah, I am. Jamie's just saying someone's done it. Someone's done it. <laughs> Jamie, in the, Jamie, Jamie in the background there. I guess you can hear you sort of uh, pottering away, getting things ready. What are you doing back, back there, Jamie? I'm um, preparing orders to go out on uh, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, so. that's a, this is the thing. Like I knew full well that um, yeah, is, thank you very much for giving away a bit of your time because you really, you, you've got stuff to do <laughs> in the middle of term three. Yeah, term three is usually very busy. Uh, for us with uh, focus on body systems and national curriculum now. So we've got a lot more schools coming in line and doing um, our sort of stuff during term three. So it uh, puts, the, puts the pressure on a bit. Hey, Jamie, while you, you're with us right here, just um, tell us how you went with the uh, holograms. Oh, yeah. So um, the holograms run through a, just an app on your uh, smartphone and it develops a, a video with uh, four images uh, playing at the same time and you place a, um, a plastic um, truncated pyramid upside down on the screen of your smartphone and it projects the images onto the four sides of the pyramid. And if you step back from it a bit, it looks like that image is actually inside the pyramid, which is pretty cool. So um, I went up to one of the local schools and took some of the more interesting specimens from the Bone Museum up there yeah. And the kids had to make their own projector and then um, we filmed um, video of some of the specimens and then they projected the, the film, uh, the video onto their projectors. So, um, yeah, fun and games. That's awesome. And I love how the tie-in with, the, with your local project, with the, uh, the Gimpy Bone Museum project. I mean, it's, it's apart from just driving awareness, those kids may well be involved in your first, when you, when you actually get up and running with it. Yeah, we're hoping so. You know, you know how it is. You get a, a couple of kids in each class that are really involved with what you're doing um, and you see, you know, potential um, volunteers or employees for a project like this, which is a, a not-for-profit, um, that uh, you can uh, uh, bring into the, into the organisation at a later date. So how far along are you with that project? I mean, because initially these things start off with the fledgling of, of an idea but I believe you're a bit further along with that. I mean, where are you up to at this point? Well, we have just closed down our first art exhibition. Right. Um, we got some grant funding for some artwork. And at the moment, it's a lot easier to get art grants than it is to get science grants. So that was a uh, nice little way to introduce what we wanted to do to the town because we, <laughs> what we don't want is a big white room full of... Um, skeletons in glass cases Yep. because that's, and that's the vision that everybody has. When you say bone museum, people think, oh, big room, um, hall of bones, everything's going to be white and black and, you know, we'll walk around and we'll look at it and we'll read the little sign that says horse, cow, pig, chicken. Yep. And we want something much more interactive and something much more interesting and we want to involve not only scientists but artists and musicians and anybody that's got an interest in bones or using them um, to make things or do things with. Um, so an art exhibition was a nice way to start. Jamie did build us an entire camel in the middle of the room. All right. Which was really cool. Her name's Nora because he spent a lot of time saying bloody Nora. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had... Uh, we had some really beautiful framed artworks. We had four different artists involved um, and it was hugely popular and it was extended from four weeks to six weeks and we just closed that down. 
but we have been offered um, a shop in our main street for the Christmas holidays and it's about twice the size of that exhibition space. So now we're gearing up to have um, a small museum exhibition open for the Christmas holidays. Yeah. Uh, incorporating some of the stuff that came out of the art exhibition that we've just finished and some more stuff and starting to gear it more towards the scientific side of things um, now that we've sort of whetted everybody's appetite. And if that's successful and it's paying for itself, we will just stay open either by appointment or permanently if we've got volunteers and just grow from there. Um, and if it's not uh, patronised as well as we would like it to be, well, then we'll shut it down and we'll open up next school holidays at Easter. Yeah. Because uh, Jamie and I are generally of the opinion that you can plan things for years and years and years or you can just pull your finger out and get going. Just I do love it. that. I really, really, really respect and love that because, I mean, I think um, there's so much stagnation in perfection. Um, there really is. I mean, I don't know how – I'm sure there's some actual phrase you meant to say, but the number of people who just rework and rethink and rework and rethink as something within an inch of its life, and all it is is just sitting on a whiteboard or in some Word document and never actually gets shown to the world for I – mean, what they say, no idea um, – uh, survives its first first front with the public ever, anyway. <laughs> so I just like the idea that you're doing that. That's great. And, uh, you know, your, your website will never be perfect. If you want to fiddle with it until it's perfect before you release it onto the internet, you will be doing that until the day that you die. Just put it out there. Just get it going, you know. And um, the more that Jamie and I get out and talk about these projects that we're doing, the more interesting people come out of the woodwork that want to help. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's cool. And the thing is, like, what you're doing is modelling exactly what modern thinking is when it comes to teaching kids about how engineers actually think and the way scientists think in the real world is test and perfect, test and perfect, test and perfect, but you never really get to perfection in the first place. That's exactly right. And, you know, Laura the Camel was a good example of that. In the beginning, we discussed just having the exhibition completely set up when the doors opened. As mm. you would see at a, a museum or an art gallery, you walk in and it's all done. But in the end we decided that Jamie would actually build Nora through the duration of the exhibition so people could come in and see her being put together. And that meant that he spent a bit of time lying on the floor holding ribs on and things like that, yes. and people were walking over him, but it generated discussion and people got to see Nora being put together. And they're going to tell that story too. That's cool. Yeah, it gave me the opportunity to, to talk to people, not just about uh, the camel, which most people couldn't recognise from first sight as to what it was, um, and talk to them a bit about the rest of the exhibition as well while I was down there. Mm. That's really cool. And, and I mean, even eminent scientists get these and anatomical differences messed up quite often. I, like, I don't know what's grabbing my memory is remember um, when they first showed Iguanodon like a long time ago and they had it all on, on all fours and you know the thumb spikes that we know exist on Iguanodon, they had it on its nose because they thought it was part of it like, like a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I know that this constantly happens and, and obviously we refine things over time but um, it's probably a good example of, hey, here's what we think it looks like and, <laughs> and then go from there. Um, that'd be interesting, actually. It'd be interesting watching kids actually try to emulate that same thing. I mean, in terms of hands-on activities, because I'm, I'm getting, I totally get that this the Gimpy Bone Museum will not be a museum in the traditional sense of collecting dust in any way. It'll be interactive and all the rest. What are you planning on the kids getting to be able to possibly do on those sites if it goes beyond just holiday programs? Um, look, the first thing that we got a grant for was a set of x-ray light boxes. Mm -hmm. so we've got five bays of x-ray light boxes and uh, a whole lot of x-rays that have been donated by different people. Yep. And they have, were on the wall in the art exhibition and they will be a permanent part of the collection. People can either bring in their own x-rays or they can use the x-rays that we've had donated and they can stand there and actually put them up on the light boxes, have a look at what it is. We'll have some interpretive books and things so that they can... Um, discover what that, what that X-ray is of and who it came from, you know, a, a male or a female and what general age they were and what was the matter with them. 
and they can stand there to their heart's content and people do. People just love it. They will stand there and go through every single x-ray that you've got out for them. A lot of the bones will be from animals that are really easy to get our hands on. So because we've dissection connections got good connections in the abattoirs, it's easy for us to get our hands on pig skulls and beef skulls and bits of rib and, and that sort of thing um, that are pretty produced and they're not precious like fossils are. Yep. So if they get dropped or broken or um, need repairs or need to be chucked out and replaced, well, that's an easy thing to do. So it will be a place where there will be plenty of things where you can just pick up a rib and walk around with it and try and find the skeleton that it belongs to, for instance. Every kid says to me, I have to have a dig pit. So <laughs> I'll be having some sort of a sandbox somewhere where they can get in and dig out their own bones and sort of that lends itself to the ability to have special guests come in and, mm. and you know, if we bury something in particular into that dig pit, we can perhaps have an expert in that particular animal come in and run a workshop where they will help us put it together and, and talk about that animal and identify the bones and do a little, you know, scientific dig. But Well, that does. That, the, that opens up the, the opportunity for collaborations um, with other museums. For example, in Queensland, the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum has... I mean, they're a working laboratory with finding dinosaur digs all the time or even just keeping it more, because you're working with predominantly mammals and thinking about, you know, you could have a visiting scholar or invite a visiting scholar from the La Brea Tar Pits in California. Like there's a, there's a few different ways that you could sort of tweak this either way. I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. it could be very interesting where you go through. I mean, I was even just sitting here thinking um, a couple episodes ago, I interviewed um, Derek Williamson, who's the director of the Museum of Human Disease out of uh, University of New South Wales. Yep. Um, and he's got a fantastic collection of human disease specimens. Yep. And I wonder, like, I mean, obviously not, you wouldn't expect, um, you know, they wouldn't be fit for human consumption with the animals that go through abattoirs if they're diseased. But I wonder if occasionally they come across, I don't know, gallstones or all sorts of, you know, weird deformities that may exist in the bones themselves that perhaps you may be able to get your hands on that people may not even exist, will realise exist. Yeah, well, um, yeah, they do see things like that from time to time. And, in fact, we discovered Nora's got a broken rib that she's actually... Uh, Re, what's the word, Jenny? Remodeled. She's remodelled, so it was broken when she was alive, and she's put herself back together. Yeah. Um, and just this weekend, we were at a local farm, and they pointed out they've got a particular horse that's got a cancerous tumour on its leg. So when they put it down, uh, we will go and have a look at the bone and see whether that's actually affected the bone. Yeah, because that makes for interesting. Um, pathology so yes there's a whole range of things and you can bring in a, an expert in human disease who will look at a horse bone and be able to explain how that would affect humans and this is what you'll see and so um, the possibilities are endless especially with the technology that we have now to be able to have online webinar hookups and things like that Absolutely so. And I was just thinking about even just looking at the processes and things that are on bones. I mean, yes, you can go into the physiology, but there's a fair bit of mathematics and biomechanics that goes and in, that's involved with this. I mean, if someone wants to just talk about simp uh, the simple version of levers, I mean, <laughs> levers all over a body, you just got to look for them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's no reason that we couldn't be pulling things apart and putting them back together. Yeah. Um, so kids can have a, a play with those knees and, and things like that. Now, there'll be some um, lab tech science teachers and people who may want to extend their um, career horizons who may be considering, and you know, they might be in another country or another district, that want to start doing the types of work that you do. I mean, what sort of advice would you have, whether it's, you know, you know, doing some of your commercial aspects in, dis in dissection connection or rock hounds or setting up a, a, a museum project like the Gimpy Bone Mu Museum Project, what sort of advice would you have for someone who's considering escaping the school's cubicle, so to speak? <laughs> I would say two things. One is just get going on it, like we discussed before. Just get going on it. You know, every little step in the right direction will get you further away from where you started. 
Um, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. You know, it's like a good shampoo. I was thinking that. Um, <laughs> it's Rachel Hunter, I think you said that originally in the, the, the original yeah. ad. <laughs> a long time ago. Gee, I'm showing my age. But anyway, keep on going. <laughs> um, and the second thing that I would say, and we learnt this one really quickly, is that it takes a village to run a business. Mm. Uh, it's nice to think that you've got a really unique idea and you need to sit on it until you can unleash it on the world. Um just, you know, a lot of people are very afraid of somebody stealing their brilliant idea. Uh, what we have found is that you just can't do it on your own. You need, we need freight partners that really understand what we do. Um, we can't just put our stuff onto any old freight carrier. It has to be the right one to get it there on time and in good nick. Um, we need good partners in the abattoirs and uh we need scientists to talk to and we need um, people who supply the styrofoam eskies to us. And it takes a village to run a business. So you really have to get out there and talk about what you want to do. And if anything, the museum project has really shown us that this is a true concept. The more that we talked about it, the more people will come out of the woodwork and help you. Yeah. Um, so that would be my, my second thing is just get going and don't be afraid to talk to people about what you want to do. You, obviously you need to be smart about that, but um, ask questions, be open, um, listen to what people are trying to tell you and seek out people who are not necessarily experienced in the area that you want to go into because you might be doing something really unique, but find people that have experience in areas that are a bit similar because they'll be a wealth of information to you and if you've come out of a classroom you know you can never have enough knowledge ever no wise words and um i think actually having a bit of fun i mean i, lo- I love the way you and jamie work i mean you're clearly not only engaged with your work but you're having fun doing it you know i have to sort of wonder I, mean, I can see so this connection has been you mentioned uh you know how these days we have ways of connecting with people over the globe and we're using zoom right now to connect um with you and i can see on behind you that you've got a x-ray set up on a light box what, what, what am i looking at there because it's a little bit far away there what you going to say uh Looks like a neck, Thrace, thoracic vertebrae, perhaps. I have. I've got a neck on the on the left there. Mm-hmm. And whose knees are they, Jamie? <laughs> Somebody's knees. Possibly <laughs> my mum's knees. I think so. Yeah, my mum's knees. She's just had a double knee replacement. Um, oh wow, that's not so good. I'll be getting some really excellent aftershots of those knees pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, I bet um, with the pins and all. Yeah. So um, I've got. <laughs> anything with pins in it, uh, anything that's got pins or plates or screws or anything like that, people love that. Yeah, the more gory, the better, isn't it? It's, really? Yeah, it is true. Hey, well, thank you very much. I know you've got a very, very busy day. Uh, you know, you've got you know, things to get up on to couriers and out on <laughs> around the country and all the rest. But uh, look, much appreciate for jumping on the podcast. And uh, I really think what you guys are doing is fantastic. And I like how you overstretch, then do something about it <laughs> in terms of um, just, yeah, you've got so much going on. It's awesome. It, it's really entrepreneurial and it does a really good thing for um, the community as, at large, which is awesome. Hey, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, if they want to follow Gimpy Bones, then you pretty much just have to put Gimpy Bones into Google and all of our social media stuff will come back. Um, otherwise, we're at dissectionconnection.com.au or rockhounds.com.au, depending on, you know, what your poison is at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll put all those um, those links on to the show notes, of course, and you can write to Deb what poison you want, you're interested in, I suppose. <laughs> um, but no. No, that'll be good. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens up in Gympie um, with the Bone Museum project. I really hope it goes well beyond your wildest expectations because I, I, I like the idea that it's not just in the capital city. I think it's great that it looks after regional centres and um, and gives a reason for people to pop off the highway. Yeah, we, we are really hoping that that um, is successful for the town too. And look, we're really looking forward to having people like yourself you know, join us and get involved and we'd love to hear what you've got to, to add to the project. So, um, oh, Jamie's just held a sign-up. Can I give a little plug for our event? Plug away. 
September 15th, which is uh, Friday, last day of school, Queensland. You'll be needing a drink by the time we get there. 6 p.m. at the Australian Hotel in Gympie. We've got Australian of the Year Professor Alan Mackay Sim coming to do science in the pub. Oh, that's awesome. So this should just go out in time for that. Uh, generally, we tend to be um, producing these on a Saturday or a Sunday. Lately, it's been Saturday. So not this weekend, but next weekend, which will be just the day before your night. So uh, so those people are listening. Hopefully, you've downloaded it, you've listened to it, and you're in the local area. Go check out that because that would be an, a, an amazing talk. I love Science in the Pub. It's always good fun. Yeah, and completely free. So uh, just... Uh you know, jump onto our Facebook page and you'll find the event there with all the maps and the details and everything that you need to know. So we're really looking forward to it. He's a stem cell champion, Alan Mackay Sim. So that's unreal. And uh, you get to you know hang around with um, like minds, and that's always good fun too. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. So, hey, thank you very much. Um, have a great afternoon, and uh, I will no doubt uh, catch you in the near future. Thank you, Ben. We look forward to seeing you. Always a good time. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. And there you go. That's the incredibly talented Deb and Jamie Cook up in Gympie who are doing a massive effort to get their community into science in such a big way. They've formed three entities. I mean, how cool is that? Dissection Connection, Rock Hounds, and the Gympie Bone Museum Project. Hey, there's definitely three different learnings that I took away from this interview. No doubt you'd have more too, but certainly one for me is just do it. Start small and aim big. And that's exactly what Deb and Jamie have been doing up in Gympie. And if you are in a museum or a school, I really think we could definitely take a bit of their lead in doing that. Just start off a little bit, start a little bit small, take little bites off and grow something that people can definitely get involved in. And I just love that. That's awesome. Hey, speaking of what's something they're getting involved in is that They've listened to their audience. They've been listening to the people visiting their museum. Well, let's just say their fledgling museum, I can imagine, will be very, very cool as it builds and builds and builds. They are making things as hands-on as possible, and they're responding to people's needs. I mean, they're listening to kids saying, hey, make a dig pick. It would be awesome if you put the bones in there. Yes, they're pivoting, and they're making it happen. That's just wicked. Hey, the last thing I certainly grabbed out of this is, hey, don't be afraid to show works in progress. I mean, that's just so cool. I mean, often people want to just have the finished product in front of people. And uh, I just love how Deb and Jamie are working with their, well, the, the Bone Museum can grow and build and they can sort of look under the covers and let people see the, you know, the warts and all for what it is. But critically, they'll get to love the place because they get to see it grow. And that's just awesome. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed podcast. Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. Yes, it's time for another Ed Tip of the Week, and this time it's a little bit different. Hey, the weather's warming up, at least Australia anyway is starting to warm up as we come into summer, and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to look at what could we do with kids and students if you can get them to a farm. What science can they learn when they're fruit picking? So what could they learn? Well, the first thing that certainly comes to mind is where does our food come from? It's fairly obvious to us as adults, but to kids, they've got often no idea when it comes to where cucumbers grow, uh, tomatoes, rock melons, pineapples. Now, seriously, pineapples. I mean, some kids literally think they just grow straight out of the ground as the pineapple that they see in the grocery store, not realizing how it actually grows. There's so many different ways that kids have it's kind of very strange conceptions about how our food grows and they don't really realize what it actually is. Number two, what is a fruit and what is a vegetable? Hey, jump on the physics website and type in uh, what is a fruit, what is a vegetable. Just You'll find a blog post which actually looks into this. You'll be amazed how where kids have got no idea as to what a seed is, what a tuber is, what a root is, what a stem, what a flower is specifically when it comes to the food that we find in our supermarket. Now she can show them on the um, farm where it grows, it'll certainly help out. Hey, you can go a bit more deeper than this. You can look at food security and looking after our resources. You could show what actually gets put into the grocery market and what actually doesn't just by the misshapenness of certain fruit. Seriously, like you won't have all fruit will be uh, brought to market purely because they're either too big, too small, wrong colour, wrong shape. And so because of this, you often will find there's quite a lot of food waste and that can be brought into the discussion as well. You could look at how farmers protect their crops from the weather, from frost, from hail, from too much heat or snow or whatever. 
people have no idea the sort of efforts that farmers actually go to to protect their crops so that before they can bring it into market. Also, another thing to bring up with kids is just as what does organic farming actually mean? That's a bit of a uh, contentious topic these days because you know, to a scientist, organic means the thing is growing. <laughs> like it's pretty much, it's organic. It's a growing thing. It has carbon in it. But to the public, organic farming often means no pesticides, insecticides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you could go into that discussion as well with them. Uh, another thing you could also bring in is the role of quarantine and biosecurity in protecting crops. Why should you not bring fruit across borders, especially into areas where they're growing fruit, because it could be transporting fruit fly, or maybe you should be bringing uh, grapes or vines into areas where there, there's a, you know, where there are vineyards. That type of idea, some kids have no idea about how vectors of disease actually can be well, transported around the place, and that can be an issue. Hey, plant growing techniques can be certainly brought up as well. Kids can learn about, you know, plant propagation and cutting and ways that they actually arrange the trees in an orchard so they can get the best sunlight to grow the best fruit. All that type of thing can be definitely there. So uh, there you go. There's a bit of a tip of the week. If you get a chance, take the students out on a trip to a farm and go check out the local, well, what are the ag- agronomists actually doing with their uh, farm? Or if you're with your family, take them out. They'll have a great time picking fruit. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Grab a copy of our new book, Be Amazing, How to Teach Science the Way Primary Kids Love, from our website. Just search Be Amazing Book. It's available in hard copy and ebook. Go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. One of the things students rarely get to do is they actually see scientists work on a day-to-day basis, actually see what they actually do for a living. On last week's episode, I got to speak with Tim Smith, who is an alumni of the National Youth Science Forum and currently working at Swinburne University on an innovation engineering project. He actually had a bit of a take on what the National Youth Science Forum does for students understanding about what STEM is all about. A fantastic opportunity to, you know, to be exposed to so many different sort of... Uh, scientific disciplines and, and get some real sort of hands-on experience as to what what working as a scientist is actually like. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that just about brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed episode. Hey, check next week's episode out. I'm speaking with Steve Sherman from Living Maths, who for the last 20 years or so has been doing maths outreach for schools and libraries and all sorts of people across South Africa and beyond. Hey, check that out. And in the meantime, please make your classes fun. Make them as engaging as possible. And I hope you really grab the students' imagination. You've been listening to me, Ben Newsom from the Physics Ed Podcast, and I'm from Physics Education as well. I might catch you another day. You've been listening to another Physics Ed podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au.